with the explosion of a thunderclap. The demal began. Slow at first, the drumming rapidly gained pace, and the long lines of dreadlocked dervishes began to move as they felt the rhythm pound through their bodies. I do live between Britain and India, and unlike some of the characters in my book White Moguls, I've never cut with England. William Dorimpool is somebody obviously who uh, has invested huge amounts of his time, energy and uh, uh, life into India. I'm not a sort of unofficial brand ambassador for Anglo-Indian unity or something, you know. The main focus in this special capsule, Reimagine, is to highlight the connect that has been established between the people of the United Kingdom and India. This is Reimagine with William by the British Council. We will focus on how William Dalrymple, through his work, not just as an author, but as art curator, as the co-director of a literature festival as well, has managed to bring about this brilliant connect. Why do you feel there really was a need mm, of this, mm, you know, mm, to mm. take Reimagine to this platform? I think the relationship between uh, the UK and India is probably more important today than it's ever been. I mean, India is going to be one of the key countries that's going to shape the 21st century. The real emphasis and the, the uh, effort should be invested in, you know, that between um, uh, our young people, that exchange of ideas, that exchange of uh, knowledge and understanding between our, our, our young people because these are the people that are going to shape the next 20, 30 years and be the leaders in the future, whether these are cultural leaders, educational leaders, uh, business leaders. William and other people who have invested time and energy uh, in that relationship because it doesn't happen overnight. You can't come in to that relationship and, 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 and pop out again. You've got to invest time and energy over a long period of time and that's what William and others have done. It was easy for one to figure that, even for someone who's not been following your work for the past so many decades, uh, for one to just follow your Facebook page and <laughs> see the kind of amazing, fascinating responses. I mean, just to know how heartbroken people were for having missed a documentary. Uh, on the White Mughal and uh, Which having, having caught it on YouTube showing. as well and, and <laughs> an absolute exhilaration oh we finally got to see it yeah so uh, I'm curious to know what's there in the work to have people so crazy madly fascinated from both countries it's an interesting thing because I do live between Britain and India and unlike some of the characters in my book White Moguls I've never cut with England. I've, uh, I've, I've never cut with Britain. I'm a Scot, obviously, and, uh, and, and it's a slightly different thing from uh, coming from the south of England. When I started, I was very clearly in my head writing travel books, explaining this part of the world to people back home. When you're writing, you have at some level an audience in mind, not mm. particularly consciously, but subconsciously, and every decision you take about how much you explain about a culture mm -hmm. uh, depends on who you think at the back of your head that you're writing for. And in Xanadu and City of Jinns, the books I wrote in my early 20s, yeah. are emphatically written for a British audience, and I expected when I was writing them that uh, it would really basically only be Brits that would get to read this. Mm -hmm. And so everything is compared to things where I grew up. I'm, uh, somewhere in, in Xanadu, I say that the Ravi in Lahore was as wide as the Tweed at Berwick. I was recently rereading that book and it was uh, uh, looking for something. And it was and I, and it's something I wouldn't write today because uh, uh, it's just not a comparison I would make. I wouldn't assume that anyone would know where the Tweed in Berwick is anymore than they'd know what the Ravi was. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's no longer the case. Um, quite early on, my books began to sell here, and in America, and in Australia. And since then, they've gone into about 40 languages. And they've become really big here, so that some of my books, like Nine Lives, sold many more copies in India than they have in Britain. Mm -hmm. um, 
and that I think probably the the breakthrough book with that was probably Last Mogul. William's writing goes back, of course, to uh, you know, 1840s, etc. Uh, his contemporary work that he does with the Jaipur Literature Festival, for example, takes his right into the 21st century. While he's written a lot on various faiths and religious practices across the globe, a lot of his work is also focused on the presence of the British in India. What was the point when you realised that, oh, it's interesting, I'm, I'm, I'm connecting the two constantly, even though I would have been in my mind, but it's in, in real readership I continue to connect? I don't know. That, I mean, you yeah, know, Return of a King is about Afghanistan, Nine Lives doesn't have any British... The word British probably doesn't come into it once. Yeah. There's a, um, from the Holy Mountains about the Middle East. So it's not like yeah. it's, this is an obsession. But mm -hmm. it is there, definitely, in the three mm -hmm. big history books. And uh, uh, no, obviously, I'm interested in how British characters react to India. And the, and the whole idea of white moguls was that they reacted in a more complicated way than we assume. There's, just as the colonial British had a very set idea of what uh, India was, mm -hmm. the post-colonial Indians have a very, clear, have a very set idea of what Britain was, represents. Yeah. And in both cases, it tends to be something very different to what we are, whichever way you're looking at it. Mm -hmm. What White Mogul shows is that the two are far from two, uh, two set identities which clash and which have never mixed and east is east and west is west. The opposite is true in that yeah. very Indian way. Right. The British are absorbed uh, into India so that by the 1780s, according to the wills, one in three Brits in India is living with yeah. an Indian woman or leaving his goods to an Anglo-Indian child, which doesn't include liaisons, casual encounters or mm. anything else. That, that just means the guys who are in a serious enough relationship to actually leave a, a will, leaving all their worldly goods to, yeah. to, an, in to an Indian woman or, a, or an Anglo-Indian kid. Talking about uh, William's art practice, uh, mm. getting into art curation, uh, do you think he's managing to make that connect as well? Because that's still engaging with the subject of looking at miniature art at a time when the yeah. Mughal dynasty was declining and the British were coming in as new patrons to that art. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you know, William's uh, uh, fascination uh, with uh, the miniatures, I think, is wonderful. And, uh, you know, when uh, his enthusiasm and passion for that, uh, I think it's great because you look at you look at this work, uh, the works in, in in a new light. So yes, I mean that's the the connect. How do you bridge the past with the present and the future? And that right. basically is what we imagine is all about. When you talk about this uh, lost period that no one wants to own up to, you've you've done the same in in an art art show that you curated as well, uh, which was on the miniature. Which style is the same period, was on, yeah, absolutely. Which is the same yeah. period, and no one really addressed it, or perhaps qualify it as a genre? It's, it's lovely. I mean, I've landed on this small period of history, which I suppose starts in about sort of 1700 and ends in 1857. It's 150 years, where amazingly little has been written. Mm. India has these sort of periods of history where everyone hones in on, whether it's the, I suppose, for Indians, it's the freedom struggle, Gandhi, Nehru, Jinnah, partition, that whole thing. Then there is, before that, the Mughals, Shah Jahan, Akbar. Before that, there's the Golden Age of the Guptas, the Mauryas. And in between those sort of highlight periods, you've got these periods of chaos, which no one ever really particularly claims or writes about. And particularly this period in between the collapse of the Mughals and the rise of the British Raj in 1857, when Victoria declares herself Empress of India and, mm -hmm. and, and Britain rather than the East India Company, a business, takes yeah. over India. This is a period which I find there's so much going on. Yeah. So much of what, for example, tourists look at in India, uh, whether it's the forts of Rajasthan or the palaces of Hyderabad or the miniatures of Nine Sukh, the Pahari, gorgeous Pahari miniatures, all this is done in this period of chaos. And it's a, a period of both enormous destruction, enormous... Uh, churning, but also huge creativity as the regions 
uh, take over from Delhi and in the courts of Rajasthan, in the, the small hill courts of, of the hills, um, in Hyderabad, in the Maratha territories, uh, in Bengal, you have all these regional schools of art and architecture, which amazingly little has been written about. Artistically, you feel there wasn't that chaos. There was creativity at its best, even in that that moment of directly transition. because of, in a sense, the chaos. Because what mm -hmm. historians call chaos actually means decentralization. In the old days of the Mughal Empire, all the taxes are going to Delhi, so the money is coming from all over India, being sucked into here at Agra, Lahore, and Fatipur Sikri, which is where the money for all those gorgeous buildings that we all love to go around uh, and look at uh, came from. But in post Nadir Shah, post 1739, when Nadir Shah destroys the Mughal Empire and the empire fragments almost overnight, you suddenly get the regional courts in Jaipur, Jodhpur, Udaipur, Gula, Kangra wonderful stuff in Lucknow, wonderful stuff in Bengal, Hyderabad, all these regional centers, plus, funnily enough, even Delhi, which is in a much reduced state. Mm. But the tiny Mughal court of Delhi is also producing incredible stuff, influenced now by you know, reflecting the, the hill states from Rajasthan and oh, bouncing yes. backwards from this. And so that the show you referred to, the, um, uh, the, the big Asian society show in late Mughal art I did, uh, Princes and Painters yes. in late Mughal Delhi, it was an incredible opportunity because how often today in an in a art historical landscape mapped out by gridirons of PhDs do you have this whole period unwritten, unresearched. Mm -hmm. And we found, you know, there were these major artists like Ghulam Ali Khan, Mazra Ali Khan. <laughs> something you, you genuinely enjoy as well, not because you have the blessing I've always been a gardener, a and I'm, I'm yeah. in a country boy. I mean, I grew up in the country in Scotland, and, uh, yeah. and I've, I'm also very sociable, and, and it's always been a tension in me how to resolve my sociable nature with my love of solitude. In a sense, this is the solution. It's a, it's a, it's a pretend farm on the edge of Delhi.